पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतेर द्यव शांतेर दिशा शांति रवांतर दिशा शांति रग्ने शांतेर वायु शांति रादित्य शांतिश चंद्रमा शांतेर नक्षत्राणि शांति राप शांति रोषद यशांतेर वनस्पत यशांतेर गौ शांति रजा शांति रश्व शांति पुरुष शांतेर ब्रह्म शांतेर ब्राह्मण शांति शांति रे व शांति शांति रुमे अस्तु शांति ही मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शंस मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरीवन एंड इन एवरीथिंग सर्वे सुखिन सन्त सर्वे सन्त निरामया सर्वे भद्रा पश्य कचि दुख भाग भवस्तर तो दुर्गा सर्व भद्रा पश्य सद्बुद्धिमानोत Sarvasarvatranandato. May all be happy and healthy. May all see what is good, and may no one experience misery. May all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies. May people everywhere find joy and fulfilment. <coughs> let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength, and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety, and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in everyone the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short <coughs> mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
Om Asatoma Satkamayam Tamasoma Jyotir Gamayam Mrityorma Amritam Gamayam Aviravir Mahiti Rutrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. So we are seeing a set of five verses, seven through eleven, which gives a, a list of twenty qualities that are essential to getting knowledge. Now, we saw that this chapter begins with dividing the entire experience into two categories. In Sanskrit, they are called Kshetra and Kshetradnya. Kshetra literally translated means a field and Kshetradnya means the knower of the field. The field was described and explained in the first few verses. In short, the field refers to everything that is material. All material entities, all which are products of matter, are Kshetra. Now, who is a knower? Who is the one who is experiencing the material universe? And in order to know the knower, we need to develop these qualities. So one who is able to develop this set of 20 qualities, for such a person will get to know the knower of the field. So know, in other words, and you know this, the the real knower is our own selves, but not this body-mind self. The body, mind, ego, they are all, as we saw in the earlier verse, are products of matter. This body is as much a part of this world as this table and chair are. So the knower is different from this body, different from the mind. The deepest core of our being is the knower. And in order for us to know that deepest core of our being, we need to develop these qualities. So yesterday, not yesterday, last week, we saw a few of these, but I think it will be good if we just recite these verses first, once again, and then we will take up those qualities once again. So let's begin with uh, verse 7. Amanitvam adam bhitvam. Ahim Sakshanti Rajavam Acharyo Pasanam Shaucham Stairya Matma Vinigraha Indriyar Teshu Vairagyam Anahankara evacha Janmam Rutyu Jara Vyati Dukha Doshanu Darshanam Asakti Ranabhishwangaha Putra Dara Grihadishu Nityam cha samachit tatvam Ishta nishto papatishu 
मयिचानन्ययोगेन भक्तिरव्यभिचारिणी विविक्तदेशसे वित्वम् अरतिर जनसम सदी अध्यात्म ज्ञान नित्यत्वम् तत्व ज्ञानार्थ दर्शनम् एतद् ज्ञान मिति प्रोक्तम् अज्ञानम् यदतो न्यथा So last week we saw the first three of these, Amanitvam, Adambhitvam, Ahimsa, humility and we saw about humility, that humility comes from a position of strength. So weak people can never be humble because weakness, any kind of weakness invariably gives rise to inner insecurity, inner uh, fear. And to cover that anxiety, fear, insecurity, uh, people try to put a mask. People try to show how powerful they are. So this external show of one strength does not spring from strength. It's more an admission of one's weakness. It, it sounds counterintuitive. So if you see any person who is trying to show what a um, strong and, uh, you know, you know what I mean, kind of a person it is, uh, you can be very sure internally they are very weak. Because a truly strong person doesn't need to demonstrate or exhibit his or her strength. It automatically comes through. So humility always comes from a position of strength. Adambhitvam, unostentation. There is no need to show off. Again, showing off one's strength to others comes from sometimes the feeling that my worth is not being recognized, that I, I have all these great qualities uh, or I, I have these wonderful things, but no one recognizes my merit. And therefore, then I need to go and show how great I am with the hope that somebody will recognize it. Again, this comes from a position of weakness. The, that I somehow feel that my worth is, depends on what, what other people think of me. And so if I think I'm great, but people around me don't think I'm great, then I need to go and somehow convince them that I'm great. But the, what I'm saying is if I'm truly great, I don't care. People around think I'm stupid, but if I'm not stupid, it's like this. Think about it this way. If someone calls you stupid, how would you react to it? And it's interesting that, of course, you don't want people to just calling you by any name. So clearly, you don't have to allow yourself to be, to be caricatured by others. But if you know deep down in your heart that you're not stupid, then anyone can call you stupid. That won't make you stupid. Just like anyone can call you a genius, but if you're not a genius, it won't make you genius. So it really doesn't matter what other people call you. You are what you are. So if we know that, then we won't be affected by what other people think of us. Neither would we need then feel that um, inner need to go and demonstrate to the world how wonderful we are. So that's a uh, uh, non-pretentiousness. Adambhitvam. Ahimsa, we discussed a lot about it last time. But what does true non-violence mean? It's not just about non-killing others or not hurting others. But it can go 
not just not hurting others physically, but also not through our words, not through our thoughts. Even being jealous of others is a form of violence. So you can see all of these qualities have to be practiced not just in a physical level, but also in a very subtle level. So if I can eliminate even jealousy from my heart, hatred from my heart, then I can say I'm truly become non-violent. Next is Kshanti. Kshanti means patience. Now patience is very important in spiritual life because while God's grace can come anytime, and we can become enlightened any moment. Um, but we also need patience. What if you don't become enlightened by next week or by next month? So sometimes we need to have a lot of patience. And therefore, but we need that. When will patience be possible? It will be possible with, with when you have a lot of faith in the heart. It's like this. If you are driving to some place and if you have a clear idea about how far that place is and what speed you're going, then you probably know how much time it's going to take. But let's say you're going to some place, you have really no idea how far that place is. You also have no idea with what speed you're going. So it's very difficult to calculate how, how much time it's going to take. So every now and then the doubt may come, am I really getting there? How do I know I'm going closer to that goal? The only thing that will keep you going and moving is this faith that I'm on the right road. Because if a doubt comes about the road itself, then there is no chance of ever reaching, reaching your destination. Now, same thing is true with regard to spiritual life. In some sense, we know, of course, from a Vedanta students know, the goal is to know yourself. And nothing is closer to us than our own self. Unfortunately, uh, it really still looks a very distant goal. And sometimes it looks a distant goal because we objectify the self. We think in terms of God or some divine being. And that divine being or that supreme truth seems very, very far away. And with what speed are we going towards that truth? We don't know. So we don't know how far it is. We don't know with what speed we are going. So how would we even know that we are making progress? How, what is it that will help us remain on that path? And what will help us remain on the path is this firm faith that I am on the right path. And that is why... The Shraddha, our faith is so important. Because if the faith dwindles, then we might say, oh, let me just take an exit and see if there's some other road going someplace else. And then, of course, all the detours that occur in our lives happen because of that. So patience is very important. Swami Vivekananda often used to refer to what he said, the three Ps, purity, patience, and perseverance. So Kshanti is patience. The next is Arjavam. Arjavam means straightforwardness. No, no crookedness in the heart. Straightforwardness, sometimes people say, I'm a straight shooter, which is kind of, which is, which is a good quality, but, but, but it can be taken to a very ridiculous extreme. In the name of being straightforward, people feel it's a license to go about hurting others or, or, or or saying what we feel like, no matter what the consequences. I think, I think this has to be coupled with Ahimsa that I mentioned before. So being a straightforward doesn't mean that I just go about recklessly hurting other people. And so here is this question. If I see someone is a fool, would straightforwardness mean that I go and tell the person, you are a fool? because I just say things as they are. So would that be a good quality? Would that mean I'm straightforward? Now, taken literally, yes. I think someone is a fool and I go and tell them they are a fool. Of course, I'm being straightforward. But if I'm truly being straightforward, then I will just pause and ask myself, 
Am I really seeing things as they are? Because, as, as the later verses will make it clear, what we see outside depends on how we see ourselves. So a spiritual seeker will say that if I truly believe that God is, exists in everyone and in everything, the divine spirit pervades the entire creation, then I should have been seeing the divine spirit in front of me. Instead of seeing that divine spirit, I'm really seeing a fool there. So whose fault is it? It's my fault that instead of seeing God, I'm seeing a fool. And why am I seeing a fool there? Because there is a fool right here. So because I'm a fool, I'm seeing God as fool. And therefore, the straightforwardness would mean recognizing that the problem is here, not there. So being straightforward is not a license to go about doing what we want and saying what we want. It means being very careful. It means being seeing things as they are, but not just seeing things superficially, seeing them deeply. That's the idea. Acharyopasanam, Acharyopasanam, so serving one's teacher. Now, this is very much stressed in the Vedanta tradition. And there have been so many stories in history, in epics, and even in the Upanishads of how service to one's teacher can bring enormous benefit to the student. Now service, of course, can be done in many different ways. Uh, but the best service, and this is, this is what my teacher used to often tell me, but the best service that a student can do to the teacher is to carry out the instructions of the teacher in letter and in spirit. And the most important instruction of the teacher is the instructions you were given when the teacher accepted you as a student, what we nowadays call initiation or mantra diksha. So doing one's own spiritual practices sincerely, faithfully, with patience, with perseverance, day after day after day, that is the best service of the teacher. So, it's possible to serve teachers in many ways. Do it in as many ways as it is possible for you to do. But always recognize this, the, this is the most important service. Doing your own spiritual practice, your own prayer, your japa, your meditation regularly. Because if that is neglected, then no other service is of any value. So that's very important to remember here. Shaucham. Shaucham means purity. Now purity is sometimes described both in, in yoga literature and in Vedanta literature as well as, as external and internal. So external purity would obviously mean a daily shower or a bath and keep wearing clean clothes, taking care of one's external cleanliness. But internal cleanliness is even more important. So not just as we are able to wash away the, the, the dirt on the body with using soap and shampoo and all those things, how do we wash away the dirt on the mind, the, the, the limited, narrow, um, materialistic tendencies that stick on the mind? And that's done with at least two ways. One, of course, through japa. They say, repeating God's name, repeating your mantra, purifies the heart. So that's one important way. And a second way is be always being vigilant, being very careful to see what my mind is thinking and how my mind is thinking, how I'm relating to the world around me, to the people around me, how, what kind of words that I use when speaking with people, what is the nature of the work that I do, now, all of these things are important. The more we think about it, then we see how much of this internal uncleanliness clings on towards. So anything that we do that is ethical, that is moral, that takes us closer to our spiritual ideal will make us clean. Anything that does the opposite, that will make us a sense of unclean. And how do we know it? Well, we just feel it. Every spiritual seeker will feel it internally. External cleanliness 
can be seen with eyes and can be even seen by others. But internal cleanliness, most of us just know it ourselves. Because what's going on in our heads, what's going on in our minds, only we know. Actually, to some extent, we may think that what's going on in our heads, only we know and no one else knows. Not fully true. Because all of us are not on our guard all the time. So when we are on our guard, we can keep our inner self kind of hidden and kind of put our best face to the external world. So when you're in a guard, then you can be very loving, you can be very kind, you can, depending on what kind of clothes you wear and how you move, how you talk, and, and no one will know anything at all what's, what's going on inside your heads. But what about the times when you are not on your guard? It's not always easy to be fully on your guard. So oftentimes, unconsciously, in these moments when we let down our guard, so to speak, that is the time this inner being comes out. And that is the time sometimes uh, you might see, sometimes some of your friends may say something very bizarre, and then you are like, what? I never would have thought this person would have capable of saying something like this or doing something like this. So those are the kind of moments when this inner being, which is kind of hidden from the world, um, is let loose, so to speak. And then suddenly someone may say something bizarre. Sometimes we surprise ourselves. It's not as if we know what's inside us fully, our own selves. So sometimes some kind of thoughts will come in the mind and you will be surprised, like, what? What am I thinking? How are these thoughts coming? So it's like we ourselves are sometimes not aware of what we are capable of thinking, doing, or saying. So the, the person inside is not only unknown to the world outside, but oftentimes unknown to us as well. Except when we are able to do this sufficient amount of self examination or introspection, then we get to know ourselves, our own self better. And those times in which we are not on our guard, our friends also might then see some side of us that the rest of the world may not even be aware of. Now the ideal, the goal towards which we are moving, is that this kind of a division between that external persona and the inner person, this division has to go. Because as long as this division lasts, we can never be at peace. There will always be this fear, oh, this is something I must be careful that others shouldn't know about it. And so, so you can never be completely mm, carefree, so to speak. So the, the more we are able to remove that wall, the more we are able to do away with all masks in life. And that's, that's what an enlightened being is. An enlightened being does not need any masks. What is inside and what is outside become one. That is why it is sometimes said, live your life in such a way that you will not have to hide your diary. Now that's the goal. And that kind of transparency, we may not have reached that state of transparency yet, but it's good to recognize that that is the goal towards which we need to move. Because as long as this transparency is not there, um, we cannot be completely free in life. Stairyam, steadfastness. This is again another important quality. We know st steadfastness is always respected and treasured in the world in which we live. If you are at your workplace, if your boss feels that you are, you, is, you are someone who can be depended on, if your boss feels that here is a steady person, I know this person is loyal, will hold on to the job, will never give, and you will be a valued member of wherever, uh, whichever group you are a part of. 
So steadiness is honored everywhere, even in our daily life. It's very important in our spiritual life as well, because the main instruments we have for our spiritual practice are body and mind. Whether you're doing a prayer, worship, meditation, service, study, anything. And I'm just restricting at present the discussion only to our spiritual practices. But body and mind are, 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 are our instruments, primary instrument in addition to other things. But we know, and I've said this often, that the body and mind both have their ups and downs. Well, they are part of the material world and all material entities, there are ups and downs. So there are times when the body may be very healthy. There are times when the body may not be so healthy. There are times when the mind may be filled with energy, very positive. There will be times when the mind is just kind of tired, exhausted, or just filled with negativity. Or sometimes the mind may be filled with great devotion, great love, and there would be times when the mind just feels dry, mechanical, just don't feel like doing anything. And everyone passes through these ups and downs in life. So steadfastness, sthairyam means no matter what the condition of the body or mind is, a spiritual seeker will hold on to their practice. So if you do daily prayer, worship, meditation, study, if you are able to do it, whether or not your body and mind are always cooperating, whether or not you are in a mood for it, whether or not you feel like um, doing it or not doing it, but you, you will continue to do it. Now that kind of steadfastness, that kind of stability is very helpful. Because it's easy, it's easy. sometimes people are very enthusiastic in the beginning for meditation and prayer, and they're just like, oh, let me do it. And after some time, it becomes one more chore. That among the many things I have to do, oh, this is one additional chore. Um, and then if they don't see uh, immediate results, then there is this great temptation. It's like, okay, let me just skip it for today. I've got a headache, or I've got lots of work to do, or I'm very exhausted. So we tend to then start find, find excuses to put it off. So sthairyam, steadfastness means now, just as, think about it this way, no matter how tired we are, or no matter what, what kind of aches we have in body and mind, we never say, oh, I'm just, I've been, I've been breathing right from the time I was born. I'm just going to, this weekend, I'm not going to breathe. Just going to give rest. We don't, why don't we do that? Because, I mean, there is a lot of work. The heart has to pump its blood and, 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 and the lungs, there's so much work. You say, I'm just going to take a rest. No, we don't do that. We don't do that because we know that doing that would mean death. And I don't want to die. So because I know the consequences of it and I don't like what is going to happen, so I keep on breathing no matter how difficult it is. Do we realize the consequences of skipping our prayer or meditation for a day? And, and apparently, in a very superficial sort of way, well, you skip your meditation one day, nothing, no big deal. Nothing seems to happen. You're still living. Life seems to go on just fine. So we feel as if no much damage is done. But actually, if you, have, if you look at it a very sukshma drishti, as I said, through very subtle eyes, a lot of damage is done. It's just that our perception has become so gross that we can understand the damage done by death, or damage done by some, some great illness. But this kind of a subtle damage done but not being steadfast in some of these important practices in life, we don't recognize. But just because we don't recognize doesn't mean it's not happening. So steadfastness is very important in order to get that supreme knowledge. Atma vinigraha, self-restraint or self-control. Again, now as I said, all of these qualities are seem different, but they are also interconnected. So, what does self-control mean? It simply means this, that 
recognizing first that I am the boss. When you go to your workplace, you might have some, there might be some other boss there. Uh, but as far as just your life is concerned, as far as you are concerned, you are the boss. Now, who, 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 who are you going to boss over? The body, the mind, the ego. So you have these sets of instruments and they, they are your employees. You are the employer. Now, any kind of a workplace, everything goes smoothly. If boss is sane and the people are under working under the boss, do exactly what the boss tells them to do. And so as far as this workplace is concerned, the boss who I am, I have to be sane and make sure that all these employees of mine, the body, mind, ego, do their job properly. Now that's what self-control means. In other words, if I want the mind now to go and study something, that's what the mind should do. But if these employees become uncontrollable, you tell the mind, now go and study, and the mind said, no, I want to watch the football game, then, then the boss has lost control over the thing. So self-control really means recognizing that you are the boss. As Swami Vivekananda famously said, that matter is your servant, not you the servant of matter. So body and mind are the wonderful instruments God has given us. Make use of those instruments. Make and recognize that they are the instruments and you are the one who is using that instrument. If you don't exercise your power over your body and mind, they will exercise their power over you. And which is why, as I mentioned on earlier occasions, the, the, the value of fasting as a part of spiritual practice, for instance. Now, tomorrow is Ekadashi, and a lot of people observe uh, fast once a fortnight. Now, this is, this is the reason why fasting becomes helpful. Besides the fact that an occasional rest to your digestive system is helpful anyway, from a purely health standpoint. But from a spiritual health standpoint, the benefit is this. Let's say you are accustomed to drinking a cup of coffee every morning at 8 o'clock. And you might think, well, I'm the boss and uh, I want coffee. I'm a free being. I can drink coffee when I want. But sometimes, even when we may think we are free, that might be only an illusion of freedom. It's very likely that your body and mind have gotten accustomed to that 8 o'clock coffee so much that when it's 7.55 or 7.58, and if you have been doing it for a long time, then there's kind of an inner bell goes, or if you set up a, you won't even need a reminder if you, if you, if you drink coffee every day at set time. An inner time goes, coffee time, and then you go dutifully and fix a coffee and drink it. Now, it's quite possible in fact, very likely that it's the body and mind. The body has gotten used to that cup of coffee so much that at 8 o'clock your body sends a message, coffee time. And you, who are the boss, go fix a cup of coffee and serve your master, the body, which ordered you to go and get a coffee. So when occasional fast, what occasional fasting does is this. So say you decide someday to observe a fast, and it's eight o'clock, the body says, coffee time. And then that time you get a chance, at least occasionally, to tell the body, nope, I'm the boss. I'm not going to give you coffee today. So at least occasionally, you can assert your authority. Occasionally remind yourself that even if your body and mind demand something, you retain the power to say no. Now, it doesn't mean that being a boss simply means saying no all the time. Obviously not. But you get to decide when to say yes, when to say no. So that's the spiritual benefit of fasting. Because sometimes people say, well, what's the big deal about fasting? Well, fasting, its only big deal is this, that 
in our daily life unconsciously while we labor under the illusion that we are free we might be just carrying out the demands that our body and mind make upon us all the time so we have become the instruments and the body and mind have become our bosses so we need if we are able to remind ourselves that i am the boss and slowly with practice with steadfastness we will be able to have control over us then and actually life you will be able to enjoy life even more if once your body and mind become dutiful servants Swami Sharadananda, a great disciple of Ramakrishna, when he wrote that big biography of Ramakrishna called the Ramakrishna, the great master, he used to say he was that time living, there is a place in Calcutta, it's called Mother's House or Udbodhan, where Holy Mother used to stay. And so he was an attendant of Holy Mother, he was taking care of her and Mother would be staying on the upper level and Swami Sharadananda's room was just near the main door. And so he would be monitoring, it's almost like everyone, whoever comes to meet the mother, they had to go by him. And he would be screening the visitors, making sure that mother is not troubled, the right time they come, so it is a very busy work. Not just taking care of the guests, but taking care of that whole household. And then he took upon himself this task of writing this definitive biography of, of Ramakrishna. which needed a lot of research. Now, how would, did he manage this? And so he says that when, it was, when he sits down to write, he said he would, and this is true, he said he would tell his ears, don't hear anything. And he says, then for the next few minutes, as he wrote, he didn't hear nothing. He didn't have to put earplugs, he didn't have to close his door. Now, I'm not saying that that's, that's like that's what everyone of us should have i mentioned this to show that it's possible so this atma vinigraha is an important important quality and in our in our daily life we can see um, to a person who people who do what they say um have attained a little bit of this control because if we give a word to someone i am going to do this then it's make it happen now clearly there will be circumstances when in spite of your best effort something cannot be done and that's that's understandable that there were factors beyond your control but if there were no factors beyond your control if there were all factors within your control then try to do to to keep your word because that will help you that is what self control is about if any thing you decide to do and it's not about just giving word to someone else is some plan you make to yourself that's what they say actually about training of dogs so one a friend was saying that um, he he had gone to, uh, to meet someone and then that person was actually a dog trainer Uh, it's an elderly lady she one of her uh, thing uh, things she had been done for years was training dogs and so he said this uh, visitor who went to her so there were always whenever he said whenever he visited her place there were always some four or five dogs there and so he said that he just went there and uh, and he was just sitting for her to come and she was in the inner room and she was going to come out to five or 10 minutes so there was this one dog <laughs> moving about and you he just want to pass it pass his time he just looked at the dog and said sit down and of course the dog didn't care for what is the dog didn't <laughs> sit and then and then that dog trainer she came out and she had heard him say and then and then she told this person no no you can't now you have asked this dog to sit you should not let go until the dog really sits because otherwise if the dog gets into the habit of saying well it's told to me i can do it if i want to or not do it if i don't want to you will never be able to train the dog and that was amazing that um, and i heard this incident several years ago and uh, i was thinking this is so true with regard to our own body and mind as well 
Because sometimes, and, and I think probably many of us have done it, probably all of us have done it at some stage. And I, 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 this was one of my very fondest exercises when I was growing up as a student was um, suddenly sometime you just awaken to the realization, oh, there's lots of things I, I should be doing, but I'm not doing. And then we'll uh, create a routine for ourselves, which is itself, the, the making of that routine itself was a very... Mm, joyful thing to do. Said, so, oh, from this time to this time, I'm going to get up every day at this time. I'm going to study. I'm going to do this exercise, and then you just kind of make that thing, and you just feel very happy about it. The question is, what happens the next day? What happens <laughs> two or three days later? And uh, I'm sure many of us have made several such uh, personal routines. And I always now, and I, that time I didn't know this story about the dog. But then I, when I look back now, I really understand why, why, what is the difficulty. And therefore, it's not, I just mention all this to show, it's not just about when you give a word to someone else, you must keep it. But also when you give a word to yourself. So even when you decide for yourself, this is what I'm going to do, if you don't feel confident of doing it, don't even promise yourself that you do it. So, but if you promise yourself you're going to do this, or you promise someone else, make sure you do it. As I said, there may be factors beyond your control. Understood. There's nothing much you can do. Granted. So there is that flexibility. But don't cheat. If you, are, if you know that it was, this happened due to your laziness or your carelessness, not because something else was preventing you from doing it, uh, then, then, you, then you have to recognize it's a problem. So the self-control or self-restraint comes from truly asserting one's authority. One's authority over one's own instruments, the body, mind, ego. And the most helpful practice in that is if you give a word, if you make a plan, either for your own self or you make a word, give word to someone else, Try your very best to keep it. Because if you can do that, you will see that you will gain a lot of control over yourself. Once Narendra Nath, Swami Vivekananda, uh, as a young man, he was just, uh, I think, 19, 19 or 20, one of his early visits to Ramakrishna, once uh, Sri Ramakrishna told him, uh, he said, Oh, you've been, you've just started coming, come again to Dakshineshwar. And Narendranath, he just said, I will try. And then he left. And, and Ramakrishna was very, very happy. In fact, he praised Narendra to others present. And he said, this boy is truthful. Because, because he doesn't want to lie or say, may give a word which he may not be able to keep. And so he said, I will try. So Ramakrishna noticed that. And you might remember, I think it's the second or third chapter in that Gospel of Ramakrishna. His visit to this really great one, there was a great um, educationist uh, in, in Bengal in those days called Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. He was a great educator. He's written many books. He's very, very helpful, very famous person of that generation. And Ramakrishna once had gone to meet him. And it was a wonderful, there's a very detailed description of that meeting in, the, in Ramakrishna's conversations. And then, um, when it was time for Sri Ramakrishna to leave, he asked Vidyasagar, he said, do come, uh, I'm there at this uh, temple in, uh, in Kali temple, near the, on the Ganges, do come and visit sometimes. And then Vidyasagar says, of course, you have come to see me, I will definitely come to see you. And he never goes to see him. Now, they, and, and we see that Sri Ramakrishna mentions it at least a couple of times or more later on. He said, Vidyasagar said he would come. He didn't come. <laughs> so these are small things are noticed. And so it's good always that even among the circles in which you move, if you can build up this true 
reputation, so to speak. If, if your friends or your family knows that, well, if he or she, if he or she says yes, it'll be yes. That's, that's something. That's what self-control is. Not like, well, this person has said yes, but I don't believe it. That's not a very good way to kind of have. Anyhow, so, but, but I think this is very important because self-control is often understood in a very negative term. It's like, oh, just don't do this, don't do that. It's not about don't do or don't do. It's being truly a boss of yourself. It means truly keeping your word. It means that steadiness. So you can see all of these qualities, humility, unostentiousness, well, that's a mouthful, harmlessness, forbearance, uprightness, service to the guru, purity, steadiness, self-control. All of these are very important. So we have finished, how many of these we finished? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, nine qualities are mentioned in verse number seven. So take a look at this and then when we meet next week, we will take some more qualities that come in verse number eight. If you have any, any questions, ideas, thoughts, feel free to share. So Swamiji, you mentioned that um, we should drop the masks that we have. Though some, some of the masks we have, it seems we keep to maintain harmony with others. So if I think of the example of not writing something in a diary you wouldn't want someone else to read, um, perhaps you write something in a diary that may hurt somebody else. So for harmony, you may there's a good password. <laughs> so, so, so you may put a mask and you may, you may, you okay. may leave it, yeah. leave it out. So how do you, um, how do you be truthful yet maintain harmony? Well, there is, there is a saying which says that satyam vada priyam vada ma vada satyam apriyam means satyam vada, speak the truth. Priyam vada, say pleasant things. But ma vada satyam apriyam, don't speak unpleasant truth. So being truthful doesn't mean just go on blabbering everything that happens. So if, if, it is, if it is a hurtful, even if it is truthful, if it is hurting, you, you don't have to. So not telling a lie is bad, but being truthful doesn't mean just going about, you don't have to say things if you don't have to. Swamiji, so we see a lot of qualities throughout the Bhagavad Gita. So in chapter 2, we see the qualities that a yogi should possess. In chapter 12, we just went over uh, the, the qualities of devo uh, devotion, devotee. Uh, and here we have the qualities of the person who will know the truth. Um, so, of course, in the best case scenario, <laughs> you should have it all. But where to start from? Um, Good question. First of all, um, not all of these qualities are exclusive. As I said, there is a lot of overlapping, first of all. Secondly, they are all kind of uh, like a creeper. So you hold on to any one of these qualities. And if you can perfect yourself in that, you'll find most of the other qualities will, will automatically come. So, so it's not like, I mean, one way is clearly to kind of make a list and go on ticking them off, which is not a bad idea, which is helpful. In other words, you are kind of simultaneously looking at the ideal way to live from many different angles, from way of forbearance, steadfastness, self-control. That's fine. Try in every which way. But what I'm saying is, well, that is great and that's wonderful and we all should do it. But the truth is that even if you hold on to any one particular quality and just kind of just make that your life's mission to do it, perfection, true perfection in any quality, you will see the other qualities will automatically come. They are all, they are all related. They are all connected. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Swamiji, you mentioned that if you see someone fool, that means you are not seeing God in that person. Uh, but sometime, you know, if if I I see God, somebody is making something wrong, and definitely that person is not God because she's making or he's making mistake. So it's my moral duty, um, you know, to correct that person. But you said that when Vikram asked that how you say that. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I, my question is, if I'm seeing someone doing wrong, that means I'm not seeing the God. So where do I stand? Even though I know that that person is um, nothing but God, but it's more my moral duty to correct that person. So where do I stand on that? No, no, seeing that person go as God shouldn't prevent you from connecting, correct me, that person. God has taken the form of a person doing something wrong. So the best way to worship God, who has taken the form of someone doing wrong, is correct that. So correcting God, who is who is taken the form of a person making mistake, is the worship there. So even even correcting someone, recognizing that truly that's divine present there, can become an act of worship. But you did mention that if you are seeing that person as a fool, then it's not uh, nothing wrong with that person or anything. It's your vision is wrong. So that was, you know, I got stuck. That how do I define myself as a devotee of God that I have a duty because I'm, I'm a devotee, but I'm not still there. So... My moral duty is to do that, like you're saying, that it's a form of worship. But if I'm seeing that person as a fool, and it's an example just to see a fool, that means something wrong in me? Yeah, of course there's something wrong. I mean, if, if, something, if nothing were wrong in me, I would already be seeing God everywhere. The fact that I'm not seeing God everywhere, there's definitely something wrong with me, no doubt about it. But... What I'm saying is, I may still be seeing human beings around me, but at least intellectually I remember that really this is all God, but I'm not able to see God as God right now. But God is appearing to me as this, not just human beings, as very imperfect human beings, which is fine. So, so long as I make, and I may not again succeed fully, but so long as I make an effort to remember that the person in front of me, there is, just as God is present in my heart, God is present in the heart of that person as well. And if now God has come to, is chosen to take a form of a someone who is making a mistake, then I, it's God in me correcting the God in that person. I'm just kind of, it's not going to make sense, but, but it's, the idea is this, if we keep that at the back of our mind, then when we correct someone, the words that we choose and the way that we do it will be different than if I don't remember that there is God in the other person. Because sometimes um, it often happens. If suppose when we, when um, parents or teachers get angry with their children or their students or, or their anger at workplace and all of that, Oftentimes, it produces kind of um, bitterness sometimes. It produces sometimes um, feelings of guilt. You just feel like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done it. Or why is this person saying that to me? You have all these kind of tensions. But now, what I'm saying is that if we try to remember that there is God present, the person in front of you also has God in their heart as much as God is in your heart. Now, if I remember that and then I say whatever I have to say, whether I'm correcting, even if I'm scolding them, if I remember that, the words that I use and the way I do it will be different than if I don't remember it. That's the idea. Yeah. There's a clarification, an online question just asking, 
to the response you give to my question, are you were you saying therefore the word being used is diplomatic? Do we need to be diplomatic without hurting anybody? Of course, I think diplomacy is not a bad word. So yes, we. I think it's good to be diplomatic so long as that doesn't involve indulging in falsehood. Yeah. yeah I think uh, years ago there was there was this. They say, "Who is a diplomat? A diplomat can tell you. I mean, if you tell someone." go to hell. But that's, that's, that's not a very pleasant, pleasant uh, way of uh, telling someone. But I said, diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way that, that you, would, you would want to do it. <laughs> Anything else? OK, so we will, we will stop here today. And next week, we will take up verse number eight. <coughs> Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. We bow down to Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. On Sunday, um, for the satsang, our subject will be dealing with disappointment. And next Wednesday, we'll continue with the study of chapter 13. And on Tuesday and Saturday, our arati and meditation will also continue as usual. So we'll conclude with a prayer on page 3. the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aurumasta of the Zoroastrians, the great spirit of the Native Americans and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto.